Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the live plenary track of the fourth day of the 21st IFAC World Congress. The corresponding plenary presentation is delivered by Jay Lee from KAIST, Republic of Korea, and the session chair, Paul Vandenhoef from Eindhoven University of Technology, will now introduce the speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, for today's plenary lecture at this virtual IFAC World Congress, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you Professor Jay Lee. Jay Lee received a PhD in chemical engineering from Caltech in 1991. And after having had academic positions in Auburn, Purdue and Georgia Tech, he moved in 2010 to the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, CUST, where he is involved in the chemical and biomolecular engineering department. He is a fellow of IEEE, of IFAC and of AICHE, and a member of the National Academy of Engineering Korea and the Korean Academ Academy of Science and Technology. Within IFAC, he has been the chair of coordinating committee CC6 on process and power systems. His research interests are in the areas of system identification, state estimation, model predictive control, and reinforcement learning with applications to energy systems biorefinery and CO2 capture conversion systems. After starting his career with MPC research, he has been engaged in the research of approximate dynamic programming for more than two decades. These days, his major research activities are in CO2 capture and utilization, from process development, design and operation, to techno-economic techno and life cycle analysis, using his systems engineering background. He is currently directing the Saudi Aramco KAIST CO2 Management Center, which started in 2013 with an annual budget of near 3 million US dollars. In today's plenary lecture, he will tell us about his insights in the development and use of reinforcement learning for process control and beyond. Professor Lee, the floor is yours. Good evening or good afternoon for those in Europe and good morning for those in the US. I hope you are well and safe amidst the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, which is affecting all of us. First of all, I'd like to say that I'm greatly honored to be invited to give this plenary talk. My only regret is not being able to present this in person in what would have been in the beautiful city of Berlin. Nevertheless, I am immensely thankful to the organizers for the invitation. The topic of my talk today is reinforcement learning. Specifically, I would like to explore with you its potential in the context of solving optimal control problems for process control applications and beyond. Machine learning, as you know, has recently come into the limelight. And this has been spurred mainly by two developments. First is the deep learning, which has provided a way to fit data to represent a very complex function in an efficient manner. Second is the GPU hardware, which has provided orders of magnitude computational speed up for tasks like neural network training due to its massively parallel structure. There are largely three branches of machine learning, as you know. Most typical is the supervised learning, which learns a pattern between labeled data X and Y. Regression and classification are examples. On the other hand, the unsupervised learning just deals with unlabeled data X to learn its distributional characteristics. Clustering, dimensionality reduction are such examples. And lastly, there is the reinforcement learning, which combines the former two with optimal decision making in a dynamic environment. For things like game playing and navigation, Importantly, unsupervised and supervised learning are passive learnings. That is, they try to learn patterns hidden in the given data. On the other hand, reinforcement learning is active learning in the sense that it includes the tasks of data generation, possibly to generate and learn new and better patterns. In the context of optimization, reinforcement learning would try to explore beyond the region of given data 
so as to find a global optimum or at least a better optimum rather than settling with a local optimum within prior given data region. Reinforcement learning has captured the world's attention when it was used in AlphaGo, a computer Go player which went on to beat the world champions. The game of Go has known to be notoriously difficult for computers due to its combinatorial complexity, but AlphaGo used the deep neural networks for value and policy function approximation so that the depths and widths of search can be reduced significantly. After the supervised learning of some human play data, it improved playing skill through active learning, powered by playing a very large number of games against itself, something like 30 million games per day. The problem was a very good fit for reinforcement learning because it was combinatorially complex, but the transition rules and evaluation rules were clearly spelled out that you could carry out very, very realistic simulations. The purpose of this talk is to examine the reinforcement learning's potential for optimal control, given the standard optimal control problem, possibly with feedback, the current method of choice would be model predictive control, also called receiving horizon control, open loop, optimal feedback control, which recurrently solves the optimization numerically for a given state at each sampling time online. Reinforcement learning provides an alternative or complementary method for solving the optimal control problem. In fact, DRL has been studied as a way to approximately solve a dynamic programming problem with names like approximate, neural, or heuristic dynamic programming and the act creating method. The question is, what extra does reinforcement learning have to offer over the established model predictive control? What are the pros and cons of RL versus MPC? Also, can you combine the RL with MPC in a complementary manner? We will examine these questions, both in the general optimal control setting, as well as in the specific context of industrial process control. Here's the outline for the rest of the talk. First, we will examine MPC and RL for optimal control on a comparative basis. After that, we will further explore the potential use of RL in process control. And finally, we will end with some applications beyond process control, including planning and scheduling decisions and their integration. So let us begin our journey with the formal definition of optimal control problem we address, which is to minimize some cost function over a time horizon subject to the dynamics given by the system of ODEs. VT is so-called the value function, which represents the cost achieved under optimal control and is a function of time as well as the starting state of, at that time. A general solution is given by hamilton jacobi bellman equation, which results from applying the Bellman's principle of optimality and is in the form of PDE for the value function in terms of X and T with a boundary condition. If solved, one obtains the value function from which the optimal state feedback law can be easily obtained. However, analytical solution is seldom possible, except for a few well-known cases like the linear quadratic optimal control problem. And numerical solution of the PD is not feasible as the computation explodes exponentially with the state dimension. Before proceeding further, I want to note a few variations to the standard problem that we just saw. The infinite horizon case results in a stationary solution where both the value function and the optimal control law are independent of time. So in fact, it becomes a simpler problem. Also, in the discrete time case, where big F here represents the integration of ODE over one time step, the PDE becomes a instead recursive equation that runs backward. This is the standard Bellman equation as originally proposed. And finally, the stochastic case involves the additional expectation operator and possibly the 
it took calculus in the continuous time case. In all these cases, with more or less complications, the same fundamental problem remains that we saw earlier. As solving the HJB hamilton jacobi bellman equation is infeasible in most practical cases, as an alternative, the so-called model predictive control method has emerged. This method, instead of solving the problem entirely offline, solves the problem online for a particular given state at each time with the aid of mathematical programming. As the computing hardware and software got better and better, the MPC approach has become a feasible approach. It should be noted that even though an optimal control problem is solved at each time, only those moves current time interval are actually implemented and the optimization is redone at the next sample time. After a feedback update of the state and the window moved forward by one time interval, this so-called receding horizon control implementation makes MPC a feedback control method. An analogy is given by this cartoon where you try to pass a truck in a highway you plan a path to do this, but for some reason, as you know, the truck speeds up as you try to pass. And I'm sure you have seen this happen through your own experience. And you must replan the path in order not to hit it. Again, to review, you solve the problem in terms of input sequence directly for a specific starting state, which is the measured state at each sample time. Inequality constraints to reflect actuator ranges and safety limits can be directly enforced, which is a huge advantage. The optimization problem to solve at each sample time is a linear programming, quadratic programming, or nonlinear programming, or sometimes mix, mixed integer programming, depending on the nature of system dynamics and the objective function. One big problem that stood in the way of a accepting MPC as a legit control theory by the control community was how to guarantee closed-loop stability. It turns out that the infinite horizon formulation gives this guarantee, but obviously cannot be solved directly. So many researchers have suggested ways to solve a finite horizon problem, but with a terminal penalty and constraints adjusted so as to mimic the infinite horizon solution without losing the closed loop stability guarantee. That problem has largely been solved by now. The main issue now is that for certain types of systems involving complex dynamics, such as high dimensional nonlinear systems of ODE, the online computation can still be a problematic. In addition, it is very awkward to extend it to the stochastic case, as it is based on the open loop control trajectory calculation. And this open loop feedback control can be highly suboptimal for such case. MPC showed up in the process industry in the 50s and 60s with several demonstration projects like the one on a catalytic fluid cracking unit of Standard Oil, a project done in collaboration with IBM. But it didn't see a widespread use until the 80s when the computers became much faster and cheaper. It was rediscovered at oil refineries and petrochemical plants with names like dynamic matrix control and model algorithmic control, mostly to solve constrained multivariable control problems. Now it is considered the factor, the advanced control method of process industry. This development had also spawned many startup companies offering solution, software, and engineering service, which later got bought out by bigger vendor companies like Aspen Tech, Honeywell, ABB, and Schneider Electric. MPC used in the process industry are mostly linear model-based, though nonlinear MPC is gaining ground. Now let us take a look at reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning also goes back a long way, starting with psychologists like Edward Thorndike in the 19th century, and mathematicians and computer scientists like Alan Turing. Here I show a quote by Alan Turing, 
on artificial intelligence. And let me read a bit here. Instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce which simulates the child's? If this were then subjected to an appropriate course of education, one would obtain the adult brain. We normally associate punishments and rewards with the teaching process. And it looks like he had some success teaching a few things. That vision by Turing has been realized today with the advent of powerful computing hardware and deep neural nets, as well as some ingenious algorithms. Formerly, in reinforcement learning, the agent tries to learn a policy, which is a map between state and action that maximizes a long-term value function, like the exponentially discounted one shown here. Again, its history include trial and error-based learning from animal psychology to some early works of artificial intelligence. It also has a connection with optimal control theory, which has long been recognized. As mentioned earlier, the general theory of optimal control is Bellman's dynamic programming, leading to Bellman's optimality equation, which is shown here for the stationary case. And this cannot be solved exactly, and one tries to conceive a way, approximate way of solving it. According to Sutton and Bartow, all RL algorithms can be regarded as sample-based approximate solutions to the Bellman equation. Research on reinforcement learning has been conducted through multiple threads, like temporal difference learning, which learns the value function based on the idea of bootstrapping, policy gradient, which learns the policy function directly rather than through the value function, and approximate dynamic programming, which tries to construct an approximate solution to the Bellman equation, being led by people like Dmitry Bertzekas, Warren Powell, and Paul Warburs. Nowadays, these threads are being reconciled to form a coherent and unified field of reinforcement learning. Application has also started to grow fast in a wide variety of domains, including game playing, elevator dispatching, robotics, navigations, etc. At this point, let us look at how one of these methods work. I want to acknowledge that Tom Bajwal at ExxonMobil has done this simulation when we were putting together a joint presentation and a paper for the PSC symposium a few years ago on a simulated bipedal robot implemented in OpenAI Gym. The example has 24 continuous states, which includes 10 range finder measurements and four continuous action variables, which are lack joint torques. The objective is to teach the robot to walk. So a large penalty is applied whenever it falls down, as well as a small penalty for the use of motor torque. After 3,000 episodes of learning, the robot can walk, but as you can see, not very well. And we do some more training. After 40,000 episodal training, it is now very efficient and working. And if you train it even more, it starts doing some surprising things, like walking on one leg in trying to save the motor torque, which is being penalized in the reward function. And finally, you can even train it to negotiate different types of obstacles. OK, so the point is that it works, but it takes tremendous amounts of training through trial and error. OK, exciting. But will this work directly for process control? Unlikely, I would say, for several reasons. First of all, in most chemical plants, it is very difficult to obtain a huge volume of exploratory data as required by most of these algorithms due to safety and other reasons. Second, one could use a simulation model to generate the, the needed data, but there may be a significant mismatch between the model and the plan. In fact, in many cases, a model may not exist at all. On the other hand, 
it does offer something attractive, which is that because it learns directly from data, it is naturally suited for incorporating various types of uncertainties into the construction of the optimal control policy. This is an important point. Now, let us explore this idea further and see how the RL may be used in process control to complement existing technologies like the MPC. For this, we first examine the advantages and disadvantages of reinforcement learning over MPC. One of the advantages is that modeling can be implicit. Note that I did not say it does not require modeling, which is a common misconception. For example, the construction of a cube function, which is the value function expressed in terms of the state and action as arguments, implicitly includes the information on system dynamics, which you have to learn. Another advantage is that it can handle nonlinear stochastic environment in a near optimal way. That is, it does more than just reacting to the error given by the feedback, which is what is done in MPC or other certainty equivalence based control methods. Also, it works with data samples rather than a mathematical model, which is more general since a declarative model is not required. One just needs a model that can provide data sample through computer simulation. It can be an algorithmic model, in other words. Finally, most of the calculation is done offline, which minimizes the online computational requirement. Then what are the disadvantages? A huge problem is the need for extensive trial and error learning, which is not feasible for most practical systems, certainly not online. This means realistic simulation must be used and should be possible, as in the case of AlphaGo. Second, because training process is basically a non-convex optimization, it may not be stable or repeatable and may get stuck in local minima. In addition, extensive goal engineering is needed, as we saw in the case of bipedal robot, robot, as the training must be redone if the goal is changed. Finally, it is very difficult to provide any sort of theoretical guarantee, but this was also a problem for many of the MPC techniques in the earlier days. If you look at the specific situation of process control, most control problems involve many inputs and outputs, often non-square and multiple objectives like set point tracking, constraint handling, and economic optimization. This is the reason why MPC has grown so popular in the process industry. On the other hand, significant uncertainties and nonlinearities oftentimes exist, and such problem can benefit from the use of reinforcement learning. However, extensive exploratory data gathering needed for reinforcement learning is seldom possible, as safety and stable operations are of utmost importance. As dynamic simulations become more and more widespread, one could conceivably use simulation data. But one should also expect significant model plan mismatch. Dynamic models used for simulations are often highly complex, involving a very large number of nonlinear differential algebraic equations. And when I say a large number, it could be thousands, even tens of thousands of equations. So how would we use the reinforcement learning for process control? Should we replace all model-based controllers with RL controllers? Because of the reasons I mentioned earlier, this clearly is not a feasible option. However, there are some strong motivations to consider RLL for process control, such as its ability to deal with nonlinear stochastic or uncertain characteristics. So one must use offline dynamic simulation data to build a good initial estimate of the value function and the optimal control policy. In generating such data through simulation, one should simulate not just the modeled nominal dynamics, but also its uncertainty, for example, through Monte Carlo simulations. Such offline constructed value function and policy function can then put 
online for further refinement. But this should be done in a rather cautious, safe, controlled manner, not to jeopardize the integrity of the ongoing operation. To help you understand better what I'm saying, the rationale behind this two-step learning approach, I suggest, let me make an analogy. Humans learn from experience, but not from scratch. Most of us are born with DNAs, optimized through millions of years of evolution. Then we learn in school using somewhat idealized concepts and examples. Then we graduate, get a job, but then learning doesn't stop there. Based on what we had learned in school, we learn further on the job site to become an effective worker in a real industrial situation. Just like that, we shouldn't subject these neural networks representing the value function and policy function directly to online on-site training. We should start with some sound initialization and offline learning as we normally wouldn't have access to a large volume of useful industrial data. To begin with, we can use simulation data generated with stochastic uncertainties to pre-train these networks offline. Only then, such pre-trained networks can be put online for additional training to adapt to real plan environment. Also, I do think that rather than using reinforcement learning independently, we should try to combine it with model predictive control to use them in a complementary fashion. In the offline setting, for example, the MPC can provide a good starting suboptimal policy to initialize the training in simulation. This should be much more efficient than using purely random inputs. Conversely, the value function learn can be used in MPC to reflect the long-term value of terminal state, thereby facilitating the use of shorter horizon and also reflect the effect of various long-term uncertainty. During online control as well, the two can complement each other. For instance, if the RL controller encounters a new state which it has not been trained for, it can use the MPC controller as a backup until it learns the value of the state and records it to the value function. Conversely, if the MPC controller encounters an abrupt change and has a difficulty finding a good initial guess for solving the nonlinear programming, the RL can provide such an initial guess. Now, let us examine the potential use of RL in the context of a specific type of process control problem. The target application I will discuss today is batch process control. Batch process control has not benefited much from the development of MPC thus far because its nonlinear, non-stationary characteristics given its nature of finite time transient operation. It's a good candidate for RL, in my opinion, because one has to deal with significant variations of feedstock and process parameters, in addition to the usual constrained, multi-objective, multivariable nature of process control problems. For the combined objective of economic optimization and regulation, the MPC community has proposed a term called economic MPC, where economic objective function is used. The same can be addressed with reinforcement learning, and we can, I suppose, call this economic reinforcement learning. Now, there are a certain number of choices one faces in designing a controller using reinforcement learning. First is the choice of the reward function to reflect the various control objectives and requirements. And in most batch operations, they involve distinct phases where operational characteristics change significantly. The question is whether to use one approximator to cover the entire period of operation or use separate approximators for different phases. And second is the way learning data of the reward is calculated, whether one would use do a shallow backup using bootstrapping, as in temporal difference learning, or computationally more expensive but more accurate deep backup, as in Monte Carlo evaluation. Third is the choice of algorithm itself whether to use a value-based algorithm like the deep Q learning or policy-based algorithm like the reinforced or an actor critique algorithm 
that uses both value and policy functions like the deep deterministic policy gradient. Okay, uh, we use a semi-batch polymerization reactor producing polyol from propylene oxide as a case study. It's going through a series of reactions, as you can see here. It's got path constraints and endpoint constraints. This process has a fairly complex dynamics with 12-dimensional state space and two-dimensional action space. And we will assume perfect state feedback in this case. The training data are produced by simulating the model with random perturbations introduced to one of the kinetic parameters. So that serves as the uncertainty. Let us first look at the issue of choosing the reward function and also dealing with different phases of operation. In this batch process exa example, there are two distinct phases of operation. The first phase focuses on the feeding, and the second phase focuses on the reaction. As these phases show distinct operational objectives and dynamics, we choose the reward function separate for each phase to reflect its characteristic, and also train separate actor and creating networks for each phase. In terms of learning algorithm, we consider two types of the deep deterministic policy gradient method, which is an actor critique method. It is well suited to problems with continuous action space, which is the case we have as in most process control problems. The conventional DDPG algorithm uses the bootstrapping based temporal difference line to calculate the return value for updating the networks. But we suspect that this bootstrapping nature of the conventional method may cause divergence in the case of batch process control problems because of their non-stationary finite time nature. So as an alternative, we will also try the Monte Carlo evaluation to calculate the return value in the context of DDPG. Because the Monte Carlo evaluation uses a deep backup all the way to the end of the batch to avoid error due to bootstrapping, it is computationally more expensive, but should provide more accurate return value estimate, which in turn should result in a more stable learning behavior. As we suspected, the conventional DDPG algorithm based on temporal difference learning results in a very unstable learning behavior, and an optimal solution could not be found. This is because the bootstrapping error causes the target critique network to be inaccurate, which in turn causes the policy gradient algorithm to update the actor in the wrong direction. And this in turn leads to bad input samples being chosen, which contributes to a further deterioration of the critique network. Thus, the Monte Carlo evaluation provides a remedy to give a stable convergent learning behavior. And that seems to be the case, at least in this example. Also contributing to the stable behavior was the fact that we have trained separate critique actor networks for different phases. Using a single network for the critique or the actor for the entire batch duration, we tried it, caused a similar unstable behavior. Here's the performance comparison between the nonlinear MPC and the RL controllers. Because of the model error, the NMPC controller leads to frequent violations of the path constraints where the RL controller ensures satisfaction of the constraints, despite the model error. The same trend is also observed in terms of meeting the endpoint constraints as well, which are the product requirements. One of the important traits we can achieve by introducing stochastic perturbations to the training data in reinforcement learning is active learning. Optimal control for uncertain systems balances two objectives, exploration and exploitation. And this goes back to the work of Feldbaum in 1960s, which is he called dual control. Therefore, the controller should perform active learning to keep the uncertainty level reasonable, though it may temporarily hurt the performance. This is true for a single batch operation lasting for a finite time interval, as well as multiple batch op operations where knowledge can be transferred from batch to batch. Let us first illustrate this within a single batch context using the fed batch ethanol fermentation process as an example. We assume 
two of the model parameters are uncertain, the maximum production rate and the inlet sub substrate concentration. To achieve the active learning feature, we must adopt the concept of hyperstate, which includes the information state, such as the distribution of the uncertain parameters. You can see here the difference between conventional certainty equivalence based MPC with parameter ad adaptation versus the reinforcement learning controller based on the hyperstate. You can see much more active probing by the RL controller, leading to better estimates of the parameters and in turn, higher ethanol production. Now I think that it will be very interesting to expand this idea to multiple batch case. In industrial batch operation, whenever the feedstock switches, a huge unknown perturbation is introduced. Since each lot of feedstock lasts through a large number of batches, these switches can be viewed as intermittent, abrupt changes in the batch-to-batch -batch dimension. Hence, whenever a new lot is introduced, one may use a first few batches to recalibrate the operating recipe. But this is usually done based on intuition and heuristics. We can use this idea of reinforcement learning with hyperstate to optimize the progression from exploration to exploitation in a much more systematic and optimal way. We now arrive at the final segment of this presentation, which is application beyond the typical process control problem. In fact, there exists a huge variety of problems which involve sequential decision-making process in an uncertain environment, to which reinforcement learning will be well suited. The dynamics of such problem proceeds in the following pattern. The system state representing the current information about the system and the environment is used to make a decision, which is then executed and draws a response from the system in, term, in the form of state, which is also updated with the latest information about the environment. And this sequence loop repeats continually. And the question is whether and how one can iteratively improve the decision-making ability as this repeats. Such problems are ubiquitous and commonly found in industrial manufacturing systems, finance, robotics, power systems, medical systems, computing and communication, and games, etc. In fact, in the process industry, there is this hierarchy of decision making, starting from the regulatory control layer at the bottom to the plan optimization, for production planning and scheduling, all the way to strategic investment decision at the top. Level of details in the model used, as well as the time scale of the decision making of different layers, vary tremendously from bottom to the top, making the integrated decision making very difficult due to their multi-scale nature. For instance, in integrating the planning and scheduling layer, due to the time scale difference, one has to resort to an aggregate coarse graining model of the lower layer, which results in optimistic estimates, thereby leading to infeasible inconsistent plans from the standpoint of scheduling and execution. This problem is exacerbated when significant uncertainties arise during execution. So the million dollar question is how to efficiently integrate the decision layers of different grains and time scales without resorting to coarse graining the lower layer, which causes loss of important details. So let us uh, use the example of planning renewable energy assets and scheduling their operation to meet the electricity demand. Usually the planning has to be done on a longer time scale, perhaps with a time horizon of 20 to 30 years with an early update. On the other hand, operational decisions have to be made at much faster scale. And considering a time scale slower than an hour would make one lose some important details, such as wind speed variations. Therefore, if you want to integrate the less frequent asset planning with more frequent operational decisions, one has to consider an hourly time increment cast over a very long time span of years. For example, there are 8,760 hours in a year and optimizing detailed execution decisions at hourly time scale 
over the horizon of multiple years would be computationally infeasible. On the other hand, if you coarse grain the wind and other operation relevant models, one would lead to overly optimistic estimation of the wind assets. I believe that reinforcement learning would be an excellent tool for the purpose of integrated decision making in such problems. Reinforcement learning would be used at the higher level decision layer, like the asset planning. The reason why RL would be well suited to handle such problem is because the dynamics considered at these high levels are relatively simple, involving things like inventory balances, and also the results can be evaluated very accurately and straightforwardly, which makes the use of offline simulation for generating realistic data samples for learning entirely feasible. The fact that states in such problems are accurately known, as they often are things like current inventory levels and market information, would also be a big plus. Decisions in these problems also tend to be combinatorially complex, as in the problem of AlphaGo. Significant uncertainties can exist in the decision-making environment, which can be simulated realistically as stochastic variations. Because of the large uncertainty, conventional deterministic optimization may not yield satisfactory results, motivating the use of reinforcement learning. The integrated decision-making strategy we propose combines the reinforcement learning at the higher level to solve the planning problem formulated as Markov decision process and the mathematical programming, which optimizes the decision at the lower execution level. The overall system, which includes the lower execution-based optimization by mathematical programming, is simulated to provide data samples for training of the value and the policy functions at the higher level. The learned value function at the higher level reflects the long-term value of the state which can be passed down to the mathematical program at the lower level to avoid short-sighted decisions, despite the use of a short decision horizon. Of course, to reflect uncertainties in the decision-making at both levels, one needs a multi-scale stochastic model characterizing them in a consistent manner. This can often times be constructed using historical data. Note that these uncertainties like the weather or the market condition are oftentimes non-stationary, containing both deterministic and stochastic compo components and exhibiting daily or seasonal periodic behavior. This general decision architecture that I just introduced has been used to study decision problems in a number of different applications, including microgrid design operation, crude oil procurement and production in a refinery, and raw material procurement on the arrival date and demand uncertainty. In this talk, we will discuss just one of them, the microgrid problem, given the time constraint. The problem we use to illustrate the idea is the operation of hybrid renewable energy system, which comprises conventional generators as well as wind turbines and storage devices. The microgrid is also connected to the national grid for purchasing or selling electricity as needed. The decision hierarchy for such a problem, such a system, is shown here. At the hourly level, what you have the dispatch decision, which generation devices to turn on, and how to distribute generated or stored power in order to minimize the operating cost while meeting the electricity demand. At the daily level, you have the unit commitment decision, which serves certain slow starting generators to be online for during a period of next day. Finally, at the top, you have the early decision of capacity design, which involves acquisition of new retirement of existing generation and storage devices. The main uncertainty is how much energy one gets from the wind turbines, which depends on the wind speed. And to be realistic, one must model these variations at least on an hourly basis using a temporally integrated stochastic model from hourly scale to daily and monthly scales. So we have used some simple models from the literature for wind power generation or wind power conversion, battery storage dynamics, daily demand patterns, conventional generators of which two types exist, 
a slow generator, which is relatively less expensive, but must be reserved at least a day ahead, and fast generator, which can be accessed without reservation, but at much higher cost. Another important component of integrating this decision hierarchy is the multi-scale wind model, which captures the intraday variation behavior, as well as interday and seasonal behavior. Here we have developed a way to use historical weather data to capture such multi-scale wind behavior. By combining a day-to-day -day Markov chain model, first order Markov chain model here, with an hourly deterministic bias over a day and a time series to represent a stochastic variation on top of, top of that. So this day-to-day -day model is integrated into the hourly uh, model as well. Together, they capture the interday as well as intraday variation behavior very well. Here we have used the data from the National Wind Technology Center from year 2002 to 2014, with the exception of year 2011, which was an outlier year due to the El Nino. A separate model was fitted to each month's data, and the actual data and the model-generated data were compared using different statistical measures. The match between the two was quite, quite close, and we could conclude that multi-scale wind model consistent across the time scales of seasonal, daily, and hourly has been developed successfully. The details are in the cited paper. We then compared two different decision approaches. In the first approach, we tried the two-stage stochastic programming approach, which was used by a previous research. Here, X is the first stage decision, which is the unit commitment decision made on a daily basis. And Y is the second stage decision, was the hourly dispatch decisions made over a 24-hour time period. The decision was kept at just one day time horizon due to the computational complexity, but this could possibly result in a short-sighted decision. So we compared that with our approach, the second approach. We tried the suggested reinforcement learning and mathematical programming architecture, where the result of operation over each day's simulation was sent to the upper layer for learning the value function, which in turn was sent to, down to the lower layer to be incorporated into the stochastic programming to reflect the long-term effects on the decision-making. Note that the dispatch decision at the lower level was a mixed integer linear program, which could be solved relatively fast, enabling the simulation of a very large number of days. Here are the results. Again, we used a very large volume of wind data from year 2002 to 2014, obtained from the National Weather Center to construct the wind model. We then used year 2015 to test the performance of the two decision methods to compare the performance of the two using fresh data. Here are the system parameters we used as follows. We assume we have access to three slow generators and one fast generator and batteries and HVDC or buying and selling with the national grid. The system and economic parameters were chosen reasonably to reflect the reality. Here's a simulation result that shows a trade-off between days. At the 15th day of a certain month, you can see that the suggested method incurs a slightly higher cost than the reference method by about 0.57%. However, this small sacrifice pays a big dividends the next day when the extra reserve power helps avoid the use of expensive fast generator. The improvement that results from saving the use of this uh, fast generator was 7.1%. The suggested architecture can forecast such trade-offs over days and help make decisions that are good for the long term. Here are the summary of the results over the entire tested year. Two methods led to different decisions for 151 days out of 365 days, which is about 40% of the time. And you can see that the suggested decision hierarchy consistently led to improvement over the reference method of stochastic programming. The benefits are especially large during September through February, which represent the fall and winter months, where wind variations are the largest. 
So the larger the uncertainty, stochastic variations, the more effective this uh, combined method is. The problem of hierarchical decision making in renewable energy network problems can be much more complicated, involving various types of renewable energy like the solar, tidal, and bioenergy, as well as different types of storage devices like the flywheel, battery, and hydrogen, ammonia, other chemicals, each suited for different time scale storage. Because of the complexities, multiple time scales, and uncertainties involved in solving such decision problems as a whole, I think reinforcement learning will play a meaningful role here. So at this point, let me summarize and conclude. The first point I want to make is that reinforcement learning indeed has a potential to play a role. And I believe that the role will be one of complementary in nature to enhance the performance and broaden the scope of existing optimal control methods like MPC and LTG. I think that the approach has some inherent advantages over the MPC, especially in dealing with nonlinear stochastic systems. But then it requires a huge volume of exploratory data, which must be obtained either from the real system or the simulation of the system. In applying the reinforcement learning algorithms to process control problems, judicious choices of problem formulations and algorithms are indeed needed for success. We pointed out some of these in the context of batch process control, which I think has a big potential to benefit from the technology. Finally, I show that reinforcement learning can also be useful in solving hierarchical, multi-layer decision problems in an integrated manner without resorting to coarse graining of the finer grained layer of fast time scale, which would lead to loss of some important information. So before I end, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of my students. Without them, all these developments would not have been possible. So thank you very much for your attention. And thanks again for giving me the time to present my work. And God bless you all in this very difficult time.